My name is Mandy Burrows and I'm a veterinary dermatologist from Western Australia and president of the World Congress 9 that was to be held in Sydney before the global pandemic changed our plans. Despite the fact that we cannot welcome you to Australia, I'm delighted to invite you to share the general practice and advanced clinical continuing education program from WCVD9, which is now available online. The general practice program encompasses a variety of topics specifically selected to be of relevance to veterinarians working in small animal practice. It will be delivered through a series of webinars by the global experts in veterinary dermatology and will be translated into four languages, Japanese, Mandarin, Spanish and Portuguese. Our clinical advanced program will be relevant to those veterinarians with a special interest in dermatology and dermatologists. This really is a program not to be missed. You'll be able to update your knowledge about a wide range of skin diseases that you see every day in your veterinary practice while enjoying the convenience of being able to access the information to fit in with your schedule over the next six months. This really is the most prestigious international veterinary dermatology event to be delivered for the next four years. The content is expert, precise, practical, up-to-date, well-presented, and represents the collective experience of the best the world can offer. This unique opportunity really should not be missed. To whet your appetite, we're very fortunate to have Professor Peter Hill from Adelaide University, a veterinary dermatologist of global acclaim, who will be discussing just 10 quick topics to get you in the mood. Hello, my name is Peter Hill and I am a Professor of Veterinary Dermatology and Immunology at the University of Adelaide. I'm also the Chair of the Scientific Programme Committee for the World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology. And we've decided to put together a little taster of what the lectures will look like when you register for the Congress and see these lectures in a virtual online format. And I'm gonna be giving a short lecture about a few uh, topics that are relevant to general practitioners who are interested in dermatology. And I hope that it will give you a little taster of what you can expect when you register for the whole Congress. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 30 minutes or so are 10 quick topics just to get you in the mood for the upcoming World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology. And I picked these topics because they should be just of general interest to uh, the general practice community who might be considering registering for this particular Congress. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is this skin inflamed or not. Now here we have a boxer that presents to the clinic and you can see that it has quite a red face and quite red ears. Now is this skin actually inflamed? Well in order to answer that question you have to know what the normal skin color of the dog actually is. Now it's very common in brachycephalic breeds, and, as, and especially those with white skin, for them to have very red muzzles, red skin around the eyes, and even red skin in the ears. So the only way you can answer this question as to whether this skin is inflamed or not, is to inquire with the owner what clinical signs a dog might be showing. If this dog has a history compatible with atopic dermatitis and if it has an itchy face then it's quite likely that this does actually represent inflammation but if the owner says that this is how the dog looks like when it's at home and if it doesn't have an itchy face then this may well just be the normal skin color of this particular dog so the answer is all in the history.
Now the next little topic relates to when red skin isn't inflamed. This is a dog here that has very red skin. You can see it has a quite dramatic rash on the ventral abdomen and in the inguinal region and on the medial thighs. Now, although this skin is red, it isn't actually inflamed. This dog was suffering from thrombocytopenia as a result of heat stroke. And the lesions that you can see are not inflammation. The lesions are purpura, which means bleeding into the skin. And you can see in the photograph at the bottom that we're doing a test here called diascopy, which involves pressing a glass slide against lesions that appear erythematous to see if the skin blanches. And in this case, the skin hasn't blanched, which indicates that this is not due to vasodilatation, it's actually due to uh, leakage of erythrocytes into the dermis. And this is a very useful test for distinguishing between red skin due to erythema or dermatitis and red skin due to purpura, which is normally a sign of vascular disease or coagulopathies. The next topic that I'm going to talk about is about the rash that keeps coming back. This is a very common presentation seen in dogs. You can see this dog has quite an extensive erythematous papular eruption. And I'm sure that most of you would recognize this as a staphylococcal infection. And it's very common for the, uh, this type of infection to be recurrent, especially in dogs that suffer from atopic dermatitis. Now, why is it that this rash keeps coming back? Most clinicians would say that the rash keeps coming back because the underlying allergic skin disease makes the skin more susceptible to infection. But why does that actually happen? Well, the reason it happens is due to something known as microbiome dysbiosis. We now know that the skin surface is colonized by a very diverse and rich number of different species of bacteria. And within this vast number of bacteria that are present on the skin, there are relatively small numbers of these red organisms, which are staphylococci. And if the skin is healthy, then the microbiome will stay in harmony with the skin and this diversity of organisms will remain. However, if the skin becomes inflamed, as typically occurs in atopic dermatitis, this leads to a disruption in the microbiome. And dysbiosis refers to a shift in the proportions of organisms within that microbiome. And what happens in atopic dermatitis is we see a drastic increase in the number of staphylococci relative to all the other species. And it's this bacterial overgrowth that reaches a certain tipping point that will then allow the skin to become infected. And the clinical relevance of this is that uh, normalizing this microbiome may require a course of systemic antibiotics or topical antibacterial therapy to reduce the number of staphylococci. But it's also important to ensure that the underlying inflammation associated with the atopic dermatitis is well controlled. And if that doesn't happen, then the dysbiosis will happen again. So here's the next topic. Where's the infection? Now this relates to cytology. 
it's very common for clinicians and dermatologists to examine cytological samples obtained from dog skin. And one of the commonest techniques is to use a tape strip. And what you can see here is a stained tape strip taken from a dog uh, examined at low magnification. Now within this field, the majority of what you can see is scattered keratinocytes, these blue elongated uh, structures interspersed amongst these flatter, paler keratinocytes. And if we were to just choose a random field on this tape strip and examine it under high power, we may see nothing other than those corneocytes and keratinocytes. And it's very important when you are examining a slide of this nature to scan the slide on low power to identify areas that may be of more specific interest. And I'm showing such an area here in the center of this slide. And you can see what appears on low power to simply be a purple blob. But if we enlarge that purple blob, you can see that when it's magnified a hundred times, it starts to take on the appearance of lots of smaller uh, bluey purplish structures. And as we go on to high power oil immersion, magnifying a thousand times, you can see that what was just a purple blob on low power is actually an accumulation of neutrophils and within those neutrophils, there are some obvious cocci. And this indicates that there was a focus of bacterial infection on the skin at the site that was sampled. But had we not scanned the slide on low power, it would have been very easy to miss this particular focus of infection. And we could have ended up making a misdiagnosis. And I refer to this as hidden inflammation. The inflammation can be hidden on the slide and you have to look for it and identify it on low power before you go down onto the higher magnification. So my next little topic is called when blood isn't blood. What we're looking at here is a skin lesion over the hock of a dog. It's a thickened, hyperpigmented plaque. And you can see on the right hand side that when this skin is squeezed, it appears that blood is coming out of the skin surface. Now this is not actually blood, even though it looks like blood. When you examine this cytologically, it becomes very obvious that this is neutrophilic inflammation. In other words, this is pus. And you can see here that this pus contains very large numbers of staphylococci. And this would be typical of furunculosis. Now, why in this situation is the pus red? The reason it's red is because furunculosis means that the hair follicles have ruptured due to the intensity of the infection. And hair follicles are supplied with a rich capillary network. And when the hair follicle ruptures, these capillaries also get damaged and lead to blood leaking into the infection. And so what we end up with is pus that's contaminated by blood and gives it its red color. And this phenomenon also accounts for another skin lesion that we can see in dogs with deep bacterial infections 
and that is known as the hemorrhagic bulla, which essentially looks like a blood blister. And the pathogenesis is essentially the same. So my next little topic is called when the rods disappear. And again, this is a cytological topic. Now, when you are presented with an ear infection, it's mandatory to take a swab and examine it cytologically to try and characterize the type of inflammation that is present. And on this sample here, you can see that there are large numbers of rods accompanied by some cocci as well. Now, when this uh, sample was sent away for culture and sensitivity, the report that came back only indicated that staphylococci were present and the rods had disappeared. Now, why does this happen? The reason that it happens is that in the vast majority of cases, these rods that are not reported on a culture and sensitivity report are actually carini bacteria. They're sometimes also referred to as diphtheroids because they have a similar appearance and morphology to the bacteria that causes diphtheria. Now, carini bacteria are considered a non-pathogenic commensal organism by most microbiology laboratories. And when they identify these organisms on a culture plate, they will dismiss them as resident flora and they will not perform any sensitivity testing against them. In fact, there are no CLSI guidelines for determining uh, sensitivity cutoff points against carinibacterium. So they will often simply not be reported, or sometimes they may be reported as um, diphtheroids being present. So if you ever take a sample from a dog's ear and you do see large numbers of rods, but when you culture that, the rods have disappeared, the likelihood is, is that you are actually looking at carini bacteria. And the good news about this is that these organisms don't have any inherent resistance as a general rule, and they are normally easily treated by the antimicrobials that are used to treat the other organisms that are also present in the ear. So my next little topic is referred to as when dogs become elephants. And here you can see two dogs that illustrate that particular phenomenon. And what we're talking about here is where the normal skin that you expect to see on a dog becomes so thickened and hyperpigmented that it starts to look like that uh, you would find on an elephant. Now, the pathology underlying this involves both lichenification, i.e. a massive thickening of the epidermis and, to some extent, the dermis, and also hyperpigmentation. And these are both features of chronic inflammation and dermatitis. And they are typically seen in dogs that have uncontrolled allergic skin disease often with secondary infection with either bacteria and or yeast. Now, obviously these chronic cases can be quite difficult to manage. And sometimes uh, it isn't possible just using standard anti-allergic treatments to get this condition under control. When you want to treat skin that looks like this, there is one treatment that stands above all other, others in terms of its efficacy, and that is a potent topical corticosteroid. And my favorite option 
would be mometazone, but you may have other uh, similar potent steroids in your own countries. But the reason that this is so effective is because of the one of the major side effects that topical corticosteroids have, which is thinning of the skin. And by applying this to this type of pathological change, you can actually reverse the thickening far more quickly than you could achieve with a systemic glucocorticoid or other anti-allergic treatments such as Apoquel or Cytopoint or Cyclosporin. And this reversal of pathology can actually happen quite quickly over two to three weeks. And the owners will often uh, be somewhat amazed at how quickly this problem can be brought under control as long as you use a potent topical steroid. Now, it is important to choose a potent steroid for skin that looks like this. A basic hydrocortisone cream, which is common in a number of veterinary preparations, is not potent enough, potent enough to actually reverse this change in, in a quick period of time. My next little topic I've called the skin condition that catches everybody out. Here we have a little dog that was being treated for sterile meningitis. And it was being treated with corticosteroids. And after a period of time, the dog developed some skin lesions. And the clinician that was managing this case asked me to have a look at these skin lesions. And it was very apparent very quickly when I looked at these lesions, uh, on the ear and on the trunk that we were dealing with what's known as calcinosis cutis. This uh, condition typically occurs in dogs that are on longer term corticosteroid therapy. The lesions usually present as small uh, coalescing erythematous plaques that may have a whitish center or surface. And it's very easy to confuse this particular skin condition with other inflammatory skin diseases, such as staphylococcal infections, or even just atopic dermatitis. And I have seen many, many cases over the years where dogs that have been treated with glucocorticoids have developed this condition and it has been misdiagnosed as something else. And in some cases that has resulted in the corticosteroid dose being increased or alternative drugs such as Apoquel being introduced to try and control the inflammation or the irritation associated with the lesions. So it's, an important one not to miss because it, it can occur in dogs that are being treated for other dermatological conditions. And it's very important to distinguish this from the original condition that's being treated. And here's another couple of examples of these lesions. Um, in this case, both on the ventral abdomen, you can see these coalescing highly inflammatory plaques which are very characteristic but it is common for them to be misdiagnosed as other skin diseases. My next topic is referred to as why didn't the Apoquel work? Now, it's become very common in my practice for dogs that are referred to see me to have already been treated with Apoquel before they arrive. And in some cases, they are referred because the Apoquel is not working. Now, why is it that the Apoquel doesn't work? Well, there are a number of reasons why Apoquel 
may not work. But some of the ones that I've identified are the following. First of all, the dog may not actually have atopic dermatitis at all. And this is an example of a dog that was diagnosed as having a suspected allergic skin disease. It had inflamed skin, it was itchy, it was getting secondary infections. But when I examined this dog, uh, it became clear that this, these extensive erythematous lesions here were only present on the white areas of the dog. And all of the uh, colored patches of skin were unaffected. And this actually was a case of solar or actinic dermatitis with actinic frunculosis. And the apoquel had not been effective in controlling the irritation associated with this disease. And the reason why is that apoquel is not designed to treat actinic dermatitis and frunculosis. And it's not surprising that it wasn't effective. This is another dog that was prescribed Apoquel because it was getting progressive skin lesions that were irritating the dog. And I think many of you will probably look at this dog and immediately think, looking at the shape of its abdomen, that this dog has Cushing's disease. And in fact, that is what the diagnosis was. And the skin lesions in this dog were actually calcinosis cutis. And again, it's not surprising that the Apoquel didn't work for that particular condition. Another reason why the Apoquel may not work is because of secondary infection. Now this dog was atopic and it had been suffering from fairly widespread pruritus of its face and ears and ventral abdomen as well as its paws. And it was treated with Apoquel and was referred in to me because the Apoquel wasn't working. But when I questioned the owner, it became apparent that the rest of the dog's paritis had responded perfectly to the Apoquel. And it was only the paws that remained and appeared to be stubbornly resistant to the Apoquel treatment. And a quick cytology realized that this dog had a very severe malesthesia overgrowth on these paws, and this was a malesthesia pododermatitis. Now, Apoquel is not an antifungal drug, and it's not surprising that it wasn't able to eliminate this particular problem. And when we treated this malesthesia overgrowth, suddenly the Apoquel was very effective. And this is my last topic, and I'm finishing on uh, what I'm referring to as why didn't the cytopoint work? And as with Apoquel, it's now very common for dogs to be referred to me that have already been treated with cytopoint. And when they come to see me, the owners often say the cytopoint isn't working. This is a young bulldog that was suffering from atopic dermatitis and it had been on Apoquel for quite some time. And yet it still had very severe pododermatitis. This dog's pedal paritis was so severe and so debilitating for this dog and so frustrating for these owners and so distressing for these owners that they were actually contemplating euthanizing this beautiful dog. They thought the dog's quality of life was so poor that it couldn't carry on uh, in this way. And they were very disappointed that the cytopoint hadn't alleviated this persistent irritation. And yet a very simple test of these pores revealed that the skin had a massive 
bacterial overgrowth on it. This was a staphylococcal overgrowth, which was exacerbating the underlying inflammation. I treated this dog with a topical ointment that contained fusidic acid for its antibacterial effect and betamethasone for its anti-inflammatory effect. And here you can see the results three, week, three weeks later. And the owners thought that this was a miraculous transformation because for the first time in over a year, the dog had stopped chewing at its paws. And from then on, once we had got that problem under control, the cytopoint point suddenly became very effective at managing this dog's atopic dermatitis. Here's another dog that was referred to me because the side to point wasn't working. And at the top here, you can see the condition of the dog on presentation. And it became apparent very quickly, just from the physical examination, that the lesions you can see on this dog's face and on the ventral abdomen actually represent a severe staphylococcal infection. And cytopoint is not an antibiotic. And it's not surprising that it wouldn't be able to resolve these lesions. This is the same dog after the staphylococcal infection had been treated. The lesions on the muzzle have resolved. The lesions on the ventral abdomen have resolved. And lo and behold, suddenly the cytopoint now became very effective, even though both the vet and the owner had virtually given up hope that this would be a successful medication. Here's another dog, uh, and I'm going to finish on this case, that was referred because the cytopoint wasn't working. This is an atopic Westie. It's got very severe skin disease. You can see that the skin is highly inflamed. It's becoming lichenified and hyperpigmented. And in a case such as this, it is no surprise to me that cytopoint won't immediately reverse all these pathological changes. When a dog has skin disease as severe as this, it's often necessary to use some more potent anti-inflammatory therapy at the outset, and also to ensure that there is no secondary infection or microbial overgrowth on the skin. In order to give drugs such as Apoquel and Cytopoint a fair chance when they are initiated, when this dog had these lesions treated, uh, when we got rid of the bacterial overgrowth that was present on this skin, when we reversed the chronic thickening and hyperpigmentation with a topical glucocorticoid cream that also reversed this severe inflammation, once that was all under control, the side to point suddenly became very effective and could be continued as a longer term treatment. And this is the dog after we had treated it with some uh, topical therapy, topical glucocorticoids, topical antibacterials. The dog's life was transformed. The owner was amazed this dog could look like this after a relatively short period of time. And from then on, the side to point was an effective long-term treatment strategy for this atopic dog. So that brings me to the end of this uh, short presentation. I hope it's given you a taster uh, and got your appetite for registering for the World Congress. We are going to have over 100 hours of 
recorded lectures for you to listen to covering all sorts of topics. It's going to be a wonderful Congress, and I hope we can see you all there at least virtually. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you so much, Peter, for that excellent presentation. Hello, I'm Anthony Chadwick. I'm the CEO and the founder of the Webinar Vet, and I'm thrilled that we're helping the Executive Committee of the World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology to take this meeting online. Unfortunately, because of the situation in the world, the event that was going to happen in Sydney uh, had to be cancelled. And we're so pleased that we've been able to step in and help the Executive Committee to bring the Ninth World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology into a new virtual format. And we'd like to particularly also thank the sponsors for being brave and innovative in joining us on this as well. You know, I've been going to the World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology since 1996, when it was in Edinburgh and it was WCVD3. And who would have believed 24 years later that we'd be taking it online? Who would have even known that that was, that was a thing 24 years ago? But I, I'm really honored and pleased that I, I can help to make the uh, program possible, this fabulous program that the committee have put together over the last few years, but uh, was in danger of not being heard due to the pandemic. The world and life must go on. And I'm so um, thankful to the committee and also to the sponsors that were able to help in making this a possibility. So the event is going to be recorded and available for six months. The actual uh, physical event was going to take place in Sydney, in Australia, an absolutely amazing city. And I'm so sad that I won't be able to see friends at the Congress between 21st and 24th of October, but the event will be delivered over that period, but it will be available for six months afterwards. So this is a real opportunity for you to watch all the, 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 of the streams. If you go to a physical conference, you're often limited to one stream unless you're able to bilocate. The benefit of going digital is that all streams will be recorded and available uh, for you to watch if you have the relevant ticket. So I'm again delighted that uh, the committee has agreed to take it online and also to the sponsors and there will be a special commercial exhibition at the Congress as well where you'll be able to find out about all the latest things that are happening in the veterinary dermatology world. Program, as I say, is world class, and it's a, a real opportunity for vets throughout the world to come to this Congress. This is a Congress not just for veterinary dermatologists, but also for GPs. And every time we, the Congress gets held, of course, GPs from that country and nearby countries attend. But this is a real opportunity for GPs all around the world to attend as well. So don't just think that this is a Congress for veterinary dermatologists, although clearly it's going to be full of amazing information for the veterinary dermatologists but it is also a congress that will really help to bring up uh, to date general practitioners as well you know i was a general practitioner who also had a special interest in dermatology a certificate from the royal college in veterinary dermatology as well and it is really difficult sometimes to have the time that you want to to spend on those dermatology cases in general practice. But the stream that we're putting together, dermatology in general practice, will really help to bring you up to date and fill in those gaps that uh, maybe you have. We've also got advanced dermatology for clinical practice. This is particularly, I think, for vets who've got a special interest in dermatology, maybe not dermatologists themselves, but you know, do a really good job in practice and just want to make sure that, again, they're kept up to date. And then we've also got a stream, which is scientific advances in dermatology. Some of these lectures will also be from medics. So you'll be able to see what's going on in the medical world, which may be of interest to you, if not from a pure science perspective, but if you know friends or family that have dermatology conditions, 
And then finally, we're going to deep dive into some of the species, particularly so feline dermatology, equine dermatology, and wildlife and exotics as well. And you can see the full program by clicking on the link below or copying it down uh, bit.ly slash WCVD9 hyphen full program. So do feel free to, to go onto the site to, to look at uh, the program in more detail. However, I will give you some snippets from it. The GP Dermatology CE is going to be amazing. These are the best speakers and dermatologists in the world who will be telling you about common cases that you'll see in practice and how better the speakers there these are internationally renowned speakers Ralph Muller in Munich Doug DeBoer Wayne Rosencrantz Craig Griffin and Catherine Outerbridge in America and Peter as you've heard from Adelaide in Australia and and looking at those common conditions uh, the itchy dog staph pyoderma atopic dermatitis otitis externa and hypothyroidism but then, of course, there's other topics being included, pruritus and infections, therapeutics, alopecia and endocrine disorders. So a really full program of those common things that you will probably be seeing in general practice. <clears throat> we go up a level into the more advanced dermatology, perhaps for those practitioners who've got a really special interest in dermatology. Resistant staphylococcus is becoming more and more of a problem. How do we manage that barrier function? A really, really important area of understanding otitis. If we can get the barrier function, if we can get the skin more healthy, then pathogens and allergens are much less likely to penetrate into the skin. Allergy testing, you know, is that really worth doing? A, a really um, important area. We can obviously waste time and money on doing it if we don't do it in the right way. And then we're going to be looking at immune mediated diseases and even lasers as well. So again, some fabulous speakers, really well known within the veterinary dermatology world. And I think this is going to be a fabulous stream at the Congress. The state of the art CE is, is for the dermatologist, but also for those people who just want to get a deeper understanding. So looking at atopic dermatitis, looking at autoimmune blistering diseases, um, the inflammatory response, the microbiome, which is becoming much more popular, and then also looking at some of the genetics as well and antimicrobial resistance. Species CE, we have Mandy Burroughs, who is the president of the WCVD9, is going to be talking about allergy testing in cats. Wayne Rosencrantz, management of the topic cat. Danny Scott, who is amazing, if you haven't heard him before. I did my um, elective uh, scholarship in Cornell in 1997, just shortly after I'd got my certificate in dermatology and spent three weeks with Danny and Bill Miller who, who wrote the Bible of small animal dermatology and it was an amazing experience for me. Uh, Danny is well known as a very entertaining lecturer which I'm sure you will enjoy as, as they all are. Stephen has done many webinars for us over the years and is going to be speaking about skin diseases in dogs and Scott Carver giving that particular Australian flavour, sarcoptic mange in wombats and koalas, and obviously other topics going to be covered as well as you can see. So the tickets, there are three categories of tickets for the event, and I just wanted to go over those so you understand maybe which one is best suited for you. So the general practice dermatology tickets, I think is particularly for those who perhaps aren't that experienced in dermatology. So new graduates, people moving into small animal from other fields, people who've perhaps taken some time off practice to start a family who are then returning and just want to get back up to date again. A fabulous um, ticket to buy 
only £110, you'll get around about 24 hours of CE from the general practice dermatology, but you will also get access to all of the company symposia, which will make up a similar number of hours. So around 40 to 50 hours for only £110. Obviously, you get the CE credits, and we are hoping that the Congress will be race accredited, access to the 3D exhibition, and we will be doing some Facebook Live updates as well. The next ticket, which is the Advanced Clinical Dermatology ticket, is for those who have a special interest in dermatology, perhaps doing it in general practice, want to get better, want to keep up to date with what's going on. That particular ticket obviously gets you the um, general practice dermatology ticket. It also gets you the advanced clinical dermatology and it also gets you the species dermatology and of course the company symposia as well. So probably 70 hours plus again only for £220 and you will have six months access to those webinars and we will be giving you access to the, the 3D exhibition and obviously there will be the Facebook uh, live updates that will happen uh, during the time as well. Finally, the 330 ticket, the full program ticket, everything including the state of the art lectures that I talked about before is included in the 330 ticket and this is obviously the ticket that uh, dermatologists should be buying. So if you are seeing a lot of referral dermatology, this is the ticket for you. And you can see there, just um, go to the ticket sales and you'll be able to look at those in more detail as well. But they are available for six months after the event as well. I think the 3D exhibition is going to be really exciting. Looking at those new products that have come out, the, the the World Dermatology meeting has always been very useful for me to know what's coming out in three to four years time. So when I was at Bordeaux in 2016, there was a lot of talk about Cytopoint. Obviously now it's well established, but you will hear about the new things that are coming through as well. Uh, so always very interesting to go into the exhibition this time it's going to be a bit different, it's going to be virtual, but I think your socks will be blown off by just how interactive it will be. So I'm looking forward to seeing you on the webinars, but also at the exhibition. If you are a member of any of the following associations, you also get a discount on your WCVD9 ticket. So I'm a member of the American Academy of Veterinary Dermatology, as well as the European society for veterinary dermatology as well but we've also got um, associations in Canada in um, the uh, Anzac countries Australia and New Zealand in Japan and other parts of Asia as well so if you are a member of any of those associations you will get in fact 20 percent discount off the tickets that happens automatically uh, if you click on the button when you're trying to uh, buy your ticket. Prices are going up at midnight on the 1st of October UK time and they will increase by 20% so it's a real opportunity to save money buying your ticket before the, the 1st of October, before the end of the 1st of October. If you are a vet nurse or a resident and you want to attend the conference then you will get a further 20% off the price of your WCVD9 ticket by putting in residents or nurses 20 into the discount code box at checkout. And in fact, we're also doing a resident day which is being sponsored by Zuetis. That is only available to residents. So please don't apply for that unless you are a resident or have been particularly invited. We're also going to be translating into several other languages. So if English is not your first language and you think you will struggle, the basic CE, the, the clinical dermatology for GPs will be translated into Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, and Mandarin. As part of the Congress, the ISVD are doing a, a sort of slightly separate uh, online Congress as well, which is just about dermatohistopathology. It's not included in any of the ticket prices. 
So if you have a particular interest in dermatohistopathology, then that is uh, an extra price that you would need to pay. It's a hundred pound unless you are a member of the ISVD, in which case it's only 75. And you can learn about all things pathology from diagnosis of alopecia disorders, some fantastic wet labs, and also ClinPath where pathologists and clinicians come together to discuss cases uh, with the pathology uh, to aid and abet in diagnosis. So just to remind you again, there are the ticket prices um, £110 plus VAT for the general practice dermatology ticket, but there is a discount down to 100 if you are a member of any of the associations. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, to 220 if you down to 200 if you want an advanced clinical dermatology ticket, if you if you are a member of one of the associations. And also the full price for the full program is 330. But again, if you are an association member, it brings it down to 300 pound. If you are a resident or nurse, don't forget to use the discount code. I'm really looking forward to seeing many of you at the Congress. This is a Congress for all sorts of vets and nurses from uh, GPs, residents, clinical dermatologists, nurses or veterinary technicians who work in a practice assisting vets it, it really is going to be the event for veterinary dermatology over the next four years and it's a huge opportunity for those who perhaps couldn't have got to australia to attend without travel cost without hotel cost and even without having to take time away from your practice i do hope that we'll see you there thanks very much and do take a note of the URL there and try and buy your ticket before the 1st of October unless you want to pay the extra. Take care. I'm Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet and I've been so pleased to have you on the webinar. Bye-bye.